Like in the real world, we can't see anything if there is no light in the visible spectrum to illuminate the environment. In computer graphics, we can approximate lighting with various models. In rasterizing renderers, it's computationally expensive to account for the light that has been scattered around the environment before reaching a surface. Although newer ray tracing hardware can do this type of lighting to some extent, for rasterizing pipelines, we can approximate the average color and intensity of the environment using an ambient light. As you can see, ambient light doesn't depend on viewing angle and the orientation of surfaces in the scene. Therefore, everything is affected equally, making all objects appear flat. So ambient lights only have color and intensity. Position and direction don't make sense because the light is coming from everywhere and from all directions. In general, at most one ambient light is enough for most purposes. Therefore, we don't explicitly implement them in the lighting system, but they can be passed as part of a global constant buffer to the shaders if we need this type of lighting. When the light source is very very far away, the rays that originate from that source will seem parallel when arriving at the scene. Because all rays are parallel, it doesn't matter where objects are with respect to the light. Each object will be equally lit, just as was the case with ambient lights. However, they are only lit on the side facing the light source. Directional lights can have different intensities and colors. Examples of directional lights are the sun and the moon. We can have emissive objects within the environment, like lamps and spotlights. Local light sources that emit in all directions can be approximated using a point light. A point light doesn't have a size, but can have a position, intensity and color. We can fine-tune this model by defining how fast the light loses intensity as objects get farther away from it. This is called attenuation or falloff. We can also define a range beyond which the light doesn't affect any objects. This is important for optimizing rendering, where we don't want to calculate lighting for pixels that are not affected by a certain light. If a light source doesn't emit in all directions, we can often approximate it using a spotlight. Spotlights have the same properties as point lights, however they also have a direction. We can define the cone of the spotlight using an angle with respect to the light's axis. We can use another angle to define how quickly the light falls off outside the cone. These are the light types that we are going to support in Primal Engine. However, there exist more realistic lighting models that we will be likely to implement in the future. These are area lights, which are lights that, as the name suggests, have an area from which they emit light. This is closer to how light sources are in the real world and therefore look more realistic. Today we will start with directional lights as they are the simplest to implement. Since directional lights don't have positions, they can't be excluded from the scene in any meaningful way. That's why we call them non collable lights. All light types that have a position and an effective range can be called from regions where they have no effect which we'll be implementing when we do light culling for the forward plus lighting. Before we start though, I'd like to explain how lights are grouped together. Imagine a building with two rooms, and each room has a number of lights that illuminate each space. Obviously, it would be a waste of computation to do lighting for the room that's not visible to the player. So we can either disable those lights or add them just before the player enters the room and then we disable or remove the lights in the room that the player left. Although that works, it's quite inconvenient to keep track of which lights belong to which room and when and how to turn them on and off. This is further complicated if you would have more rooms. Instead of doing this, we can group the lights in sets, which we can switch between depending on where the player is. If we allow only one light set to be used at any time, then switching lights is simply a matter of setting a set as active when the player enters the room and all other lights will automatically turn off. Before writing the pixel shader, I'd like to briefly explain basic diffuse and specular lighting. This is one of the simplest lighting models that, although not physically accurate, produces results that are good enough to fool our brains to think the lighting is correct. Suppose we have a surface, S, with a normal, N. 
we can have a light ray shining from any direction onto the surface. We can model the diffusion of this light by the surface, simply by stating that the light ray is scattered equally in all directions. The amount of light that's reflected by the surface depends on the direction of light. At grazing angles, the amount of reflected light becomes smaller, whereas when the light shines from directly above the surface, the amount of reflected light is at its maximum. Note that it doesn't matter from which direction we view the surface. Keeping the light direction constant, we always see the same amount reflected from all directions. Because in this model, light is reflected in all directions equally, if we'd sum the reflected light's energy along all directions, we'd get a value that could be greater than the amount of energy that came in with the original light ray. In other words, the energy output can be greater than the input, which is physically impossible. There are of course more physically correct lighting models, but we'll get to those after we've set up the basics. Light that's reflected off of a surface has an additional component that both depends on light direction and the viewing angle. This is called the specular component of lighting, and as you can see, it has a direction that we'd get by reflecting the light vector along the surface normal. Also note that the amount of light that the camera sees depends on the camera's position with respect to the surface. This model is called Fong Lighting which dates back to 1975 when it was published. Let's have a look at how it can be expressed in mathematical equations, so that we can use them to calculate the lighting in our shader programs. Let's consider the angle theta between the incoming light ray and the normal vector of the surface. As we saw earlier, the amount of reflected light is at its maximum when theta approaches zero. When the light ray is parallel to the surface, it's not going to be reflected at all. We can mathematically model this behavior by using the cosine function of theta. As you can see, the value of this function is 1 when theta is 0, and it goes to 0 when theta has a value of negative or positive pi. Remember that the cosine of the angle between two vectors is proportional to the dot product of the two vectors. If we make sure that our vectors are normalized, calculating this cosine is a simple dot product. We must also reverse the direction of the light vector in order for the result to have the correct sign. So the diffuse part of the lighting can be calculated by taking the dot product of the normal value at the pixel position and the negated light direction. For the specular part, we first need to reflect the light vector along the surface normal. Then we can create the same transition from theta equals 0 to theta equals plus or minus pi. This time however, we're going to raise the resulting value to some power. We call this the specular power. The higher this value, the smaller the specular spot will be and the shinier the surface will look. Here we can see what our model looks like using different specular powers. The final color of the pixel is the sum of diffuse and specular lights, multiplied by light color, light intensity, and surface color. In order to better test the engine and have a little fun as we go, I've prepared a 3D scene that we can try and import using the level editor. Here's what the scene looks like in Maya. It's supposed to be some kind of hangar or laboratory building where all kinds of tests are being done, and from the looks of it, not all of it might be legal or ethical. While I did make this scene, a large number of 3D models come from different sources and were not modeled by me personally. Roughly half of the models within the scene come from this site called Kitbash 3D, where you can download one of their kits for free. These are fully textured models that you can download in various formats. It's called Mission to Minerva, and as you can see, it's intended for sci-fi cinematics. There's been a competition for artists to create short movies using these assets, some of which are also showcased here. The other parts of the scene contain models made by Mike Winkleman, or Beeple. It's an animated scene that's called Zero Day, and is also used by NVIDIA in their ray tracing demos. The complete Cinema 4D project is available for download for free from his website among his other beautiful creations.
you can find the rendered animation on YouTube which looks really great with the music. In which we use a cyber weapon to create physical destruction. A battle is waging across the internet. In my limited time and 3D modeling skills, I also created this spaceship model, which is actually something I did about 15 years ago, and recently I did the building and the fan, which I'm especially proud of. And of course I created the Jane model a while back. Oh I almost forgot to mention that the statue models are from Sketchfab. This entire scene is available for download if you're a Patreon supporter. I'll put the links to all these websites in the video description. Don't worry if you don't have access to these models, you can use anything that you can get your hands on, whether it's from the internet or by making a model in your favorite 3D application. Something as simple as 3 cubes would do fine.